Thank you, Dan, and to everyone who has joined us this afternoon for this important event in the life of the law school. I want to express my enormous gratitude to Northwestern University and its leaders for this honor of university-wide chair and for the confidence shown in me by selecting me as the law school's new dean. Both honors are important and humbling to me. It makes me happy, very happy, that they come at exactly the same time, for as Dan alluded to, they track the two principal dimensions of my professional life in the law. I have always cherished and worked hard on both aspects of my career. And when I measure success in my endeavors, such as they have been, it has been on both the dimension of a legal scholar and of a law school leader. So it makes it a special honor to be acknowledged on this occasion for both roles. I should also say that the designation of Harold Washington Professor is meaningful, not only because it is a prestigious uni university-wide honor, but because of what it denotes as a commemoration of the work and life of one of our distinguished law school alumni, Mayor Harold Washington of the class of 1952. Let me take just a, a moment to reflect on the first dimension of this honor, an award of a distinguished chair in acknowledgement of my work as a legal scholar. As to that work, I want to say thank you for the honor conferred on the basis of work already completed and urge you to also stay tuned for work yet to follow. I am not done yet with my scholarship. In my academic work, I have been interested, broadly speaking, in the relationship between law and politics, in the ways in which we govern ourselves in a plural society where stakeholders, interest groups, and concerned citizens interact with legal officials to pursue individual and collective ambitions. I have made some contributions to the fields Dan Linzer mentioned in his kind introduction, sometimes alone and sometimes with able co-authors, and I very much expect to continue working on these projects. A scholar's life is taken up, after all, with the transmission of research and of the building of the sum of human knowledge through the research he or she produces for publication. And a legal scholar's life includes, at least for most of us, and certainly for me, the opportunity to shape through our scholarship and our advocacy the course of public policy and of the legal profession. And I am very proud to call myself professor of law at Northwestern University. Now I have a day job, of course, and that is the dean of the Northwestern University School of Law. It is a job that, after all, consumes a good deal of energy and requires much focus. The obligations of this post are high, and so too are the opportunities that arise to add to the greatness of this already great law school. As a result, the work of the dean of the law school is hard work, but it is also very much fulfilling work, and I'm pleased to have this position. And again, let me express gratitude to the leaders of Northwestern for the faith and confidence they have shown in me by this appointment. The, the history of the deanship of Northwestern Law School tracks, of course, the history of the, the, North, uh, the Northwestern deanship tracks, of course, the history of the law school generally. It is a story of remarkable progress over more than a century. In this story, the individuals who have served in this post, my predecessors as dean, have added value and have made their respective marks. I'll say a few words about that history, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge and recognize the Northwestern law deans I have had the good fortune and opportunity to get to know. They are all friends of mine, and they have all contributed to the legacy of NU Law in appreciable ways. My cherished colleagues David Ruder and Bob Bennett served ably as deans of this law school and advanced the objectives of the school with their own distinctive styles, leaving the law school stronger when they left the post than when they began. They are always helpful to me, happily not shy with their opinions, deeply invested in the institution, and sources of inspiration to me as I hope to build on their accomplishments. The same is very much true of my immediate predecessor and friend, David Van Zant, whose contributions to the modern Northwestern Law School over a decade and a half were many. I had the pleasure of working with David in various legal education venues, and I can tell you, as an interested observer of Northwestern during the contemporary era, no law school in America had a more forceful, creative advocate. If I close my eyes for a moment, I can picture David clad in his ubiquitous purple, describing to his fellow deans one or another Northwestern initiative, usually with the benefit of a PowerPoint slide, each with an annoying big N in the bottom corner. 
He too left Northwestern Law School stronger as a, as a result of his efforts and energies, and I am grateful for his contributions and his continuing wise counsel. Looking over the panorama of Northwestern Law School's history, one of the most striking features is just how few deans there have been. If you leave to one side the matter of interim and temporary deans, although with my colleague Kim Urako here today, I cannot do so without noting her own important contributions to our law school's forward progress, then the number is remarkably just 10. That I am the 10th dean of the law school is a daunting fact. Northwestern law deans, as you may know, tend to stay long in the saddle. Indeed, the two most celebrated deans of the earlier Northwestern era, John Henry Wigmore and Leon Green, led the law school from 1901 to 1947 together, a remarkable, a remarkable string, certainly never to be equaled. As the current dean, I sometimes try to project myself into the shoes of these great early leaders to see whether there are any decent similarities. I leave that to others with historical sensibilities to decide. Here is what the Chicago Legal News said in the obituary for the first dean of the law school, Henry Booth, who, by the way, served in this position for 32 years. Quote, for unflinching integrity, Booth had no superior. His word imported verity. Certainly sounds like personal attributes well worth emulating. But it goes on. Quote, he was a latter-day Puritan. There was that stern facing of truth that willingness to do any kind of painful duty. As I look across the room at the hopeful faces of my faculty colleagues, I simply raise the question of whether and to what extent these qualities describe me well. And with regard to the matter of painful duty, perhaps we'll know that best after we get through a few budget cycles. As to the great deans of the first half of the 20th century, Wigmore and Green, these are truly hard acts to follow, to put it mildly each towering figures in legal education and transformative deans whose respective legacies are both extravagant and enduring. Dean Wigmore's appointment to the deanship was the result of a retention matter, interestingly enough. When the new University of Chicago Law School opened at the very beginning of the 20th century, they went hard after Northwestern's two most prominent faculty members, Julian Mack and John Henry Wigmore. Mack abandoned Streeterville for the bright lights of Hyde Park, and Wig Wigmore became dean. In the short time here today, I couldn't do justice to the contributions of Dean Wigmore to Northwestern Law School's history, and rest assured, I won't even try. I will just say that one of the daunting aspects of my job, however, is that I come to work every day knowing that I have the same job as did John Wigmore, and that's a rather intimidating fact of life. Similarly, Leon Green, the great tort scholar, has served, had served in this post as well. He and I share in common that we both came to this position as carpetbaggers, each having come from elsewhere and also having served as dean at another law school previously. Leon Green came to Northwestern from Yale in the fall of 1929, and before that he had served for a short time as dean at the University of North Carolina. Following his long service as our dean, he left Chicago for the hot environs of Austin, Texas, where he served for the remainder of his life as a member of the University of Texas Law School faculty. In that respect, of course, our careers were the mirror images of one another. These were important Northwestern leaders and colossal legal scholars, not easily emulated by me or anyone else in my time here at the law school as dean. Just to give you some empirical sense to underscore the point that I'm not being unduly humble, Wigmore was, as most of you know, the great evidence scholar of his time. His greatest achievement was his four-volume treatise on evidence and a second five-volume edition of that treatise, both of which were written and published while he was dean. By the end of his deanship, his scholarly output included 22 books and over 200 published articles. Leon Green was no slacker either. Described by one of his successors, James Rawl, as, quote, one of the most virile younger, younger legal scholars of his day, Green published his first major book, Rationale of Pro Proximate Cause, his second book, Judge and Jury, and two influential torts case books while he was here as dean. Forget about a daunting legacy, this is a scary legacy. How would you like to follow these giants? It looms large over me as I think about how best to balance my commitments to the law school's successful administration and the pressure to write books and articles and make the steady stream of scholarly befitting Northwestern's deans uh, uh, to come. 
It is an enjoyable hobby to dive deeply into the history of the law school and to reflect on the ways in which I can build on the edifice created by these giants of legal education, these and other great deans. Yet Northwestern Law School's history is perhaps not best told through the stories of these leaders. It is rather told through the extraordinary accomplishments of its alumni, included among them justices of the US Supreme Court and of state courts, candidates for the presidency of the United States, senators, partners of the nation's leading law firms, captains of industries, in, uh, contributors to the public interest. It is also told through our graduates whose milestone accomplishments have honored Northwestern's memory. Graduates like Ada Kepley of the class of 1870, the first American woman to earn a law degree. And James Nabritt from the class of 1927, who argued the companion case to Brown versus Board of Education, served as president and dean of Howard Law School in Washington, DC, and who offered in 1938 the first civil rights course in any American law school. Or to Ruben Castillo, class of 1979, the first Latino federal judge in Illinois. Or to the largely unnamed students whose work with the Bloom Legal Clinic and the Center on Wrongful Convictions a decade ago led directly to the end of capital punishment in this state, an end noted by the governor in this very hall where we gather today. It is the story of these and other remarkable individuals that illuminate the history of our great law school. Students here today will add to this story through their own accomplishments following graduation, and I hope in some small way to add to this story through my service as dean of this law school. Northwestern Law School is truly a great law school. The ambitions to make it even greater are at the center of my commitment and are very much my focus. I paint on a rich canvas, already chock full with the imaginative contributions of thousands of faculty, alumni, and friends. What it looks like, like any grand painting, depends on your vantage point, how close up or far back you stand. The details are important, and it is always imperative to focus carefully in on these details. What happens every day at this law school matters. It matters to our students. It matters to our reputation. And I am acutely aware that the success of a leader, of a dean of a top law school like Northwestern, is measured in the small and medium-sized decisions made every day. But it is important as well to take a step back from these details and to look at the big picture. Events like these give us a golden opportunity to do so. And when I look at the picture from a ways away, what I see is a magnificent portrait, indeed perhaps more of a pastiche, of accomplishment and ambition of striving and reaching, of innovation and experimentation, and always, always, of pursuing excellence through the endeavors of a collegial community. We are not nearly finished, of course. The law school is, after all, a work in progress. And I promise to strive hard as dean to make sure that this law school is moving ever forward, that it is preserving the vital legacy of its distinguished past, is enjoying and even uh, reveling in its present success and is poised to become even greater as a law school whose mission is to prepare the next generation of lawyers with integrity and for service. Let me, uh, let me conclude my remarks on a personal note. The journey that has brought me to this place and to this position has not been a solo one for sure. In that vein, let me tell you all how deeply grateful I am to my wife and partner a distinguished lawyer and legal educator in her own right, Leslie Oster. Her contributions to my career have been immeasurable. But perhaps more to the point, her contributions going forward to the well-being of this law school will be tangible and enduring. As many alumni and prospective students will testify, she has already had a meaningful impact. And I'm very grateful to her for her support, her insights into legal education, and to our joint endeavors. I suspect that a colder winter than we have had this year will require me to apologize, and probably publicly, for taking her away from San Diego to one of the hottest places in the continental US, first, central Texas, and then to one of the coldest. But we are in the city of big shoulders, and we are happy to be here. I'm grateful to the rest of my family who couldn't be here today for their support. This includes my daughter, Kat, now a sophomore in college, whose most insightful pieces of advice to me when I told her I was returning to the dean's ranks were first, dad, trust your judgment. And second, try not to overreact to things. <laughs> These are good pieces of advice. And I try to follow them every day. 
This is, a, this is a very meaningful day in my professional life, and I want to thank two individuals, both long gone, whose influence in my life and the life of my family have been great in ways that today's events have led me to reflect upon. They are my grandfathers, whose own stories are both profoundly different and yet oddly congruent. My maternal grandfather, who died a couple decades back, represents, along with my grandmother, my slim connection to the Midwest. He was born and lived for many years in Columbus, Ohio, where my mother was born and raised. The family had four girls and one boy. My grandfather was a day laborer whose membership in a local union, the Teamsters, blossomed into a career as a union organizer and leader. As he became more involved in the work of the union, his politics took a much more radical turn, and although he was hardly a public figure of any sort, his political activities got him on a blacklist during the dangerous days of the McCarthy era. He and his family hightailed it to Southern California, and he was, by the time I knew him well, a source of great stories and inspiration. He would have made a great lawyer had he had the opportunity to do so. He helped instill in me the values of justice in a fundamentally unjust world, and also of the imperative of advocacy, skills which are very much a part of being a good lawyer. My paternal grandfather was born and raised in a small town in southern Mexico. As a young man, he fought in the Mexican Revolution and was chased northward by the Federales, who didn't have much appreciation for his revolutionary zeal and efforts. He came stealthily across the border and to the United States with my grandmother. He didn't have permission and was thus an illegal immigrant, back before that was such a term of opprobrium, and in fact happened to adopt an alias last name, Rodriguez, because that was a much more common name than our original family name, Barajas, and it would help him blend in. Ironic when you think about it. <laughs> my paternal grandparents' brood was the mirror image of my maternal grandparents. That is, they had four boys and one girl. Sadly, my grandmother died during childbirth when my father was two years old, and my grandfather raised his kids in a barrio of East Los Angeles as a single father. He was a remarkable man who helped instill in me the qualities of courage and fierce commitment to a set of goals in the face of disadvantage and struggle. Of the 10 siblings of these two sets of grandparents, only two went on to college, my father and my mother. And although neither graduated, they illuminated through their experience a pathway out of challenging circumstances and gave me a reason to hope that I could achieve something great in my own professional life. I am proud that my achievements have taken place in the educational realm, and I know my parents and the two grandfathers whose spirit I'm glad to mention here would be proud. I want to thank all of you for coming to this gathering. I'm pleased to join in this ceremony with my colleagues, with Tom, Jay, and John, and with so many fine friends of Northwestern. Uh, we are here adjourned. <laughs>